Hey, welcome everybody. I'm your host, Blockchain Wayne, and this is our FIO Fam feature where we get to meet people that are contributing, the humans that are contributing to uh, the FIO protocol uh, within the FIO DAO. I've got David Gold with us today. Um, David's going to tell us about his experience. David's been uh, on since the beginning with FIO, uh, one of the founders. David, thanks for joining us today to uh, t tell us about you know your insight and your con contributions to FIO. Yeah, great to be here. Thanks, Wayne. All right, David. So let's start with tell us a little bit uh, before we jump into your experience with, with FIO. You've got um, uh, an extensive history, uh, you know, your business history. So tell us a little bit about your background um, prior to uh, joining FIO. Sure. I spent most of my career in technology startups and as a technology entrepreneur, going all the way back to the dot com uh, era and uh, been involved in a whole bunch of different, um, mostly software related startup companies and also uh, was managing director at a venture capital fund for about a dozen years, investing in early stage technology companies and uh, led blockchain investments uh, for that fund uh, the last several years I was there. And it was really in those experiences that some of the ideas around the FIO protocol um, were, were created. Awesome. Awesome. So that, that's exciting. So tell us a little bit about um those early conversations about FIO and, and kind of what led to the development, how this uh, went from an idea concept to a uh, full-fledged protocol. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you the really short story because otherwise yeah. we'll run out of time. But, uh, Absolutely. <laughs> um, you know, really it comes down to as, as I jumped into blockchain, like a lot of people who jump into blockchain, the first reaction is, wow, this is complicated this is confusing. This is scary. This is risky. If I make a mistake, I can lose, you know, all my my funds. Uh, it's not user friendly. And you know, I remember the days when the same was true about the internet. Uh, people forget that the internet was around for about eleven years before uh, the World Wide Web and web browsers happened, and that's what really allowed usability to happen and usage to explode on the on the internet. Before that, the internet was complicated, confusing, difficult to use. It was it was not easy for the everyday person to use all the different ways you did things, whether it was FTP or Gopher or, or whatever, well, all these different protocols um, that were just not user friendly. Um, and so, you know, that got me and then Pavel Mastalish, another key co-founder of the protocol, thinking about how do you solve this problem for the entire ecosystem? across all blockchains and do so in a decentralized self-sovereign way. Because if, if you try to solve usability by locking everybody into centralized applications that solve usability, then you, you create walled gardens and you defeat the purpose and the value of the decentralized blockchain. Uh, before you know, the World Wide Web, there was uh, America Online, CompuServe, Prodigy. These were centralized uh, information sources, but they were very user friendly and they grew extraordinarily because they were user friendly and easy to use. But once the World Wide Web happened and people could access information in a more decentralized way, those companies don't even exist today. Um, they, they all disappeared. So that was the genesis for the ideas behind how do we solve this with an entire decentralized self sovereign usability layer whose sole focus is on making the interaction between users and between crypto applications uh, easy to use, joyful, less risky, and do that in a self-sovereign, decentralized, and highly private way. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely makes sense uh, because yeah, we don't want to we don't want to defeat the purpose of of creating centralized systems that control a decentralized experience. So. Uh, that that's that's some great insight into into that, and I know a lot of people feel the same way. That anybody listening or watching that that's used crypto um, can relate to to that, and those of us that were around during the early days of the internet uh, know how how clunky that was as well. And and you look at that adoption cycle, and it could be the same thing here. So um, now shifting to the the structure of FIO, uh, as far as FIO is governed by uh, by a DAO like the operational uh, structure of FIO. So okay, explain kind of the uh, the reasoning behind that and, and how that is structured for, for those that are watching. Yeah, so the, the you know, the essence of, of the governance around the FIO blockchain, which is a fully decentralized uh, blockchain, 
is, is that the token holders are the governance. And very consciously, the FIO protocol itself is built in a way that enables the actual products that are integrating FIO, because FIO gets used by users when their chosen application enables FIO capabilities inside of it, inside of the wallet, inside of the exchange, inside of the, the DeFi gaming platform, inside of the NFT exchange, et cetera. They use the open source FIO SDKs and APIs to enable FIO capabilities inside of their applications. When they do that, in many cases, the FIO blockchain itself is, is allowing them to participate and share the economics of the FIO chain. And so they're receiving FIO tokens. Um, the Foundation for Interwallet Operability, which is the nonprofit foundation uh, whose mission is to advance uh, the capabilities and the adoption of the FIO protocol also uh, has been giving out grants for integration in some cases. Uh, that also allows those integrators to get tokens in their hands. So the, the, the concept is that all token holders are the governance of the chain and especially the integrators and not just the centralized integrators because when you put your tokens in a centralized platform, they actually have your keys so they can vote your tokens, they can stake your tokens, all that sort of stuff. But with FIO, the decentralized applications get the same exact benefits. The decentralized applications can actually vote the tokens, the FIO tokens that are held by their users in their application if those users do not vote or proxy the tokens themselves. A lot of individual users don't know who to vote for. So those applications get to vote those tokens if the user does, chooses not to vote them themselves. They, they, they participate if the users stake their tokens, they participate in the economics of that, of that directly from the FIO blockchain. So all of that is, is a long way of saying the governance of the FIO chain, the economics of the FIO chain, are very intentionally built to enable the integrators of the platform as well as the individual token holders to be the voice in the governance of the chain. Those token holders vote for the board of the foundation. Um, and the board of the foundation uh, has chosen to appoint a steering committee that really is a, a set of people that day to day are looking at different worker proposals that come in and making uh, decisions about worker proposals and whether they should be approved or not. Um, and that's basically how the, uh, the DAO is operating at a very high level today. But it all comes back to the token holders and their power to, to vote for block producers, to vote for the board, et cetera. Nice, nice. So tell us a little bit, David, about um, your role or roles with FIO. I know you've done, done quite a bit, um, but tell us about your experience since joining FIO. What, what have you done for the project? And you contribute in many ways. So tell us about that. Sure, I mean, I have been involved in a lot of ways. Obviously, strategy, um, uh, you know, formulating the basic concepts around the protocol, the governance, uh, you know, a lot of things that went into the initial software that then was completely open sourced um, and 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 decentralized. And and the field chain itself was launched by a community of, if I remember correctly, it was like 24, 25 block producers from across the world that acted independent of of us and independent of anyone to take that open source code and spin up the blockchain, which is really, really cool to watch that, that happen. Uh, I've been involved in the planning, in the operational planning of the, you know, helping with the foundation and the, the operational planning of the foundation, helping in recruiting uh, companies to adopt the FIO protocol, to integrate the FIO protocol. So I've been involved in lots of different ways as a contributor to the, to the DAO itself. Awesome. So you've got a lot of insight, the history you've seen, Fio. I mean, I'm sure those early days of, of getting integrations were a lot harder uh, than they are now, right? It's it's one of those things, trying to get the, the first, first few um, partners to integrate. Uh, how have you seen that evolve over time as far as interest in the protocol and, and just being able to get integration partners to, to offer our protocol, you know, integrate the usability for their users? Yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, the, the biggest challenge with the FIO protocol is the chicken and egg problem sort of thing. I mean, the, the fact that the, the first application that uh, enabled the FIO protocol, it wasn't usable with any other applications because they hadn't in, enabled it. it. You know, it takes two applications enabling it for, for those applications to be able to use a FIO crypto handle or FIO request to send and receive tokens um, or use FIO data to include, you know, invoices or cards, notes, et cetera. So early on, uh, you know, the whole project, it was challenging uh, to get the initial integrators, but there were the early adopters that shared the vision of what FIO was solving and how critical it was to the ecosystem who were willing to be trailblazers and be the first ones 
to uh, to enable capabilities. I mean, companies like uh, Edge Wallet and Garda Wallet, for example, that were very early enablers of the of the FIO technology in their in their application. Uh, and then it's sort of like a snowball rolling downhill. You know, when it starts at the beginning, it's kind of hard. You have to keep pushing it, but eventually it picks up momentum. It becomes easier and easier and it starts rolling on its own. And I really feel like FIO has got lots of momentum behind it. What are we at? Over 70, I think, uh, uh, different um, applications either have already integrated or, or are working on integrations of FIO capabilities. Uh, I think we're very close to 800,000 FIO crypto handles that have been registered by users. So, uh, you know, pretty extraordinary accomplishments uh, here sitting, uh, you know, a, a bit over two years since the March uh, 2020 launch, uh, community launch of the of the FIO mainnet. Yeah, absolutely. Def definitely seems like it, there's a lot of steam going and, um, you know, it, it's kind of it's evolved. It You know, initially wallets and exchanges and now we're you were seeing NFT marketplaces and games and um, really any uh, a lot of different partners, different types of partners that are you know coming coming uh coming on boards and a lot of new use cases we're seeing uh for the FIO protocol that uh that some of our integration partners have come up with so it's, yeah, it's, I think, I think it's really important to emphasize that because you know people look at FIO yeah. and the first reaction is oh it's human readable wallet names which FIO crypto handles are human readable wallet names but FIO is already so much more than that it is it is the only purpose-built layer one chain that was has been purpose built to deal with usability to to be that that glue that connects crypto applications that standard between them uh, to allow them to handle workflow data confirmations information that has to transact between applications or between an application and a human before an actual transaction can occur um, so decentralized payment requests and fio requests cross chain data through fio data FIO NFT signatures that can be used to sign NFTs from any uh, that are created on any uh, blockchain, Ethereum NFTs, Polygon NFTs, it doesn't matter to prevent forgeries of them and protect the permanence of the data. And, and, and the roadmap, you know, that the community has for the FIO protocol is very robust and, and the, the sky's the limit on the type of things that FIO can do to enhance usability and safety of interacting between crypto applications. Awesome. Awesome. So David, as we wrap up uh, this, this FIO fam uh, feature, tell me uh, what, what do you see? What excites you about the future of FIO? Um, and is there anything in general that you, you think we, we also need to see in the cryptocurrency market, the, the, the blockchain space that needs to happen to further, uh, further adoption along? Yeah. I mean, I'm obviously very excited about what's going on with FIO and the, the FIO dashboard, which has been released, and the new capabilities around that, combined with the wrapping of the FIO domains on, uh, on Polygon and the wrapping of the, the FIO token on, on Ethereum that are coming out here imminently, um, are going to enable some really cool capabilities. Uh, the FIO dashboard being a, a decentralized self-sovereign web application where users can interact with FIO capabilities even before their, their favorite application might adopt a FIO inside of it. So they can register FIO crypto handles. They can use them to, to, to receive uh, tokens inside of a, an application that is not yet integrated FIO, and yet it's completely decentralized and self-sovereign. Um, and uh, uh, there's a Ledger app now out for FIO tokens. Uh, that will work with the dashboard. So you can even start to hold your private key, FIO private key in your Ledger a hardware wallet and use it with the dashboard. Um, so very excited about the dashboard and the wrapping that's coming very, very soon. And then beyond that, you know, the things that the community is thinking about and talking about expanding FIO requests into multi-signature requests so that multi-sig could be much easier. Multi-sigs are very difficult today. They're going to be increasingly important as organizations leverage crypto. Organizations don't want one person to have the rights to transact on an account. They need to have multi-sig where multiple people have to sign a transaction. Uh, this, that process is very complicated today. FIO requests can be enhanced to, to create a very elegant user-friendly way for having multi-sig signings occur. occur. Um, uh, the concept of having attestations on the FIO protocol where one FIO crypto handle can make attestations about another FIO crypto handle uh, for example, that this FIO crypto handle is owned by a specific person, uh, owned by David Gold, that David Gold lives at this address. And for me, as the 
owner of that field crypto handle to be able to accept or decline those attestations and to be able to control who can see those attestations becomes a very powerful way to, to expand the capabilities of FIO and, and deal with a lot of the challenges that, that uh, different crypto applications uh, are seeing around just, for example, is this a human? Is this not a human? Though, and, and even beyond that. Um, so really, the sky's the limit on what's going on here. And I think that's uh, uh, you know, very exciting for FIO. I think we're going to see more broadly in crypto an explosion over the next a couple of years. Uh, you know, several years in the use of stable coins in commerce. And FIO is going it, to enable that as well because FIO enables the usability part of that. It enables a checkout to be as simple as entering your human readable FIO crypto handle and checking your wallet for your order card that would actually appear in your decentralized self-sovereign wallet along with the full order card information so you could approve that. Um, so that explosion of use of stable coins for e-commerce um, will will just accelerate, I think, the adoption of, of the FIO protocol's capabilities. Yeah, awesome. Thanks, David. Yeah, that's some great insight. A lot of exciting things to come. I, the more I think about it, too, on top of everything you mentioned, there's, there's things that you and I and others have not even thought about that we're going to be, uh, as we expand our ecosystem of integration partners, uh, we're going to see more and more uh, use cases evolve. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, FIO NFT signatures, which are live, we're not we're definitely not thought of um, when the field blockchain was launched. That was not even something ever considered. It's a, it's a concept that came from the community later um, and was launched to, to solve a pretty critical need around NFTs and the issues around forgeries with them. So um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm excited about the, I've been excited from the beginning and I'm even you know more excited now about the potential that the field protocol has. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Well, David, thanks again for your time today, sharing, you know, your thoughts, your insights and your contributions uh, to FIO. And um, any any final words or parting thoughts? I thank you for all your contributions as well. And thanks to everybody in the FIO community, which has grown so much that uh, I don't even know everybody personally anymore who's involved in FIO. So it's definitely a global global project. And it's uh, it's really cool to to have watch this all evolve and grow um, over the last several years. Awesome. Thanks, David. Well, thanks again for your time. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Uh, have a great day and keep an eye out for our next FIO uh, FAM feature. Take care, everybody.